About 12 months ago, Urban Splash did a sort of exhibition that was hosted at the RIBA, which was called It Will Never Work. And, and I think that's sometimes the way you feel about it. You know, is there a role for the RIBA? Is there a role for the architecture profession? How can we really best get engaged? This um, slightly strange and ethereal image, these are actually bison skulls. Um, so by about 1874, um, the North American bison was actually right on the point of extinction. Um, it's an example of what happens when you have, you know, industrial firearms put together with an industrial production process, actually combined with a desire to clear land of, of, of indigenous peoples, and the bison was, was virtually extinct. But of course, this is an example where environmental damage was stopped, um, and the North American bison does sort of survive as a species, so it, it gives you hope that there is a, there is a way in which you can intervene. This one's slightly less hopeful. This isn't the latest group picture of um, Boris's cabinet, by the way. This is the, the, the Easter Island idols. Um, now, I don't think we really know what happened in Easter Island, but clearly there was an environmental disaster on a very big scale. The people of the Easter Island, they had some kind of culture that meant that they over-exploited their resources, the trees were removed, and there was some kind of environmental disaster that really had a, a big impact on, on what was a very sophisticated and complex culture. So that's the, that's the downside risk if we, if we don't take action. This one is really just for the kind of the removal of any reasonable doubt sort of argument. This is um, from the Australian Meteorological Office, the Weather Bureau in Australia. This is from Cape Grim in Tasmania. This is one of the least polluted atmospheres on the planet. Um, and this is where the, the World Meteorological Office does one of its key CO2 um, monitoring projects. And this is the growth in carbon, mono carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over time. You can see it's completely linear and it hasn't stopped at all. You know, that, that shows you one of the main greenhouse gases, how it is just growing in a linear fashion. There's been a few talks today, I think particularly, you know, some of the flood mitigation talks that we've had, which really show that to some degree what we're talking about now is adaptation. So if you read the Inter International Committee on Climate Change's reports, what they're really saying is that we are going to get 1.5 degrees of climate change now, pretty well come what may. What we're trying to avoid is these changes in climate that get up into the 2.5 degree range. So although we can some, to some degree reduce the impact of climate change, to some degree it's also an, an adaptation thing that we've got to get involved with. So the RIBA, as you know, the, the RIBA Council did have a climate change resolution. Um, it corresponded with the government's um, acceptance of the, the, the 2050 net zero greenhouse gas emissions target. It, originally that was a 90% reduction. It's now a 100% reduction. And the RIBA joined that resolution. And then the council resolution actually includes two other elements, which are a bit more about what should the RIBA do to try and contribute. Um, so the first one they said was we should develop an action plan to support that net zero carbon target and we should be seeking to influence international standards, government and intergovernmental policy and regulation and the RIBA's own carbon footprint as an organisation, what, what we do about our carbon footprint. And the second element was really to say what could the RIBA do to try and encourage the profession as well as lobbying for regulatory change what could we do to encourage the profession to improve the performance of the buildings they design and then actually report on the performance of those buildings? And again, a common theme I've heard today is this well-known performance gap. What's the gap between what we actually design for and how our buildings actually perform in, in, in real life? And of course, this, this concept of post-occupancy evaluation that we've heard a lot about today is also part of trying to understand how these buildings really perform. I think it's fair to say that both architectural profession and the RIBA have been doing a lot in this area for a long period of time. It's not true that the profession has been inactive and indeed the, the, the Institute has been active. There's lots of things that you can talk about that the RIBA does. I've just dragged a couple of examples literally just off the website. Um, this is an RIBA competition that was um, done recently that was all about flood resilient um, flood resistant development. Um, we've recently issued our embodied and whole life carbon assessment. I think one of the speakers earlier said that Perhaps as a profession we find the science sometimes a bit challenging, so anything we can do to sort of break down understanding of how you go about these calculations I think is useful. Um, and there's a whole series of events that go on around the country like today's event where architects get together and share knowledge. Um, 
I've heard different views today about Passive House, but certainly the interest in Passive House has been great over recent years, and these are some of the most successful seminars that the RIBA runs. This is a slide from the UK Committee on Climate Change. This is just showing that um, really the UK is making good progress, um, but it's where it's making its big reductions is all in the power generation sector. So the movement, particularly to wind generation, is having a big impact in the UK. We have seen a big reduction in UK carbon emissions, but when you actually come to the industrial sectors, the agricultural sectors and the built environment sector, there we've made virtually no progress whatsoever. So all the reduction is in the power generation sector, not very much happening in these actual production sectors. I've also seen this diagram a few times today. This actually goes back to Stuart Brand and how buildings learn. Um, and you've seen a number of people use it. Um, it was developed by Frank Duffy. Um, I suppose this is to make the point I really wanted to make here is that in reality, if you talk about the mass of buildings across the UK, particularly existing buildings, the biggest single challenge is to move them off, particularly the gas grid, to move them off organic fuels. Yeah, that's the really big challenge. Um, but I think what the RIBA's project that I'm going to show you in a few minutes is really about is saying that's an important part of the equation but also reducing the requirement for energy is an important part of the equation and that's why really this fabric first kind of approach is the one that the RIBA is going to try and promote um, and thinking about the, the whole life cycle of a building in the way that this diagram first encapsulated. I said this, is, this, this isn't something new. I mean, this is something that's been around for a long time. I was actually quite shocked. I, I thought that long life, loose fit, low energy was actually um, um, something more recent. It actually goes right back to 1972. Um, I thought it was Cedric Price, but it's not. It's Alex Gordon. So I've been in the library and had a look at this. There was a big report done by the RIBA in 1972. It was at the time of the oil crisis and the beginning of the environmental movement. And there was a report said that architects needed to build buildings that were flexible, that could be adapted for different uses, that could use materials that could be recycled, and in particular, could conserve energy. That was really the push that was on. Um, and if you read some of the detail of this, which I won't go through, you'll see that at the time, the big challenge that Alex Gordon outlined was he said the architects have only got so much, I think the, the, the modern word would be agency, you know, they've only got so much influence, there are parameters beyond their control, and in particular, how are they going to persuade the clients? And I think that's still going to be the challenge today. How are we going to persuade our clients to go beyond just regulatory, the regulatory minimum, if you like? This is actually taken from the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and this is really saying the sort of areas that architects within the UN Sustainable Development Goals potentially have some influence or, or some agency, if you like. What our Sustainable Futures Group have done is they've said, where are the areas where we can have the maximum impact and that's where they've asked the RIBA to focus initially. And they've looked at net zero operational carbon, net zero embodied carbon, water usage, and what I would say health and well-being, or actually avoiding the unintended consequences of some of these other things, which I'll, I'll explain what I mean in a moment. Um, there's been one or two quite important publications, I think, come out recently. This was one from the um, Green Construction Board, which is a, essentially a government-funded body. Um, and this looked at, you know, really what was the current best practice. And I'll show you some metrics in a moment to, to say best practice at the moment, if all buildings were built to best practice, we'd be well on our way to meeting a 2030 target. It's not as though this is something that's in, impossible to achieve. Um, and this was the UK Green Building Council, the net zero carbon framework definition and quite important, I think, particularly for the, the embodied carbon sort of element. So, assuming that the RIB board approves this proposal that I'm going to show you now, um, and the board meeting is next week, um, you will see in the autumn a launch of what we think will be called the RIBA 2030 Climate Challenge, or Climate Change Challenge, um, still pretty determined. And that really builds on the council motion, and it's in these three areas. It's about what is the government going to say to government, and in particular the MHCLG, because they control the building regulations, which is the primary piece of legislation we're talking about here. What changes will we ask for? How will we try and encourage our own practices to perhaps adopt a, um, a faster pace than those changes might deliver? Um, and how are we going to come together to make sure that any metrics that are used are actually shared across the industry? Because if we all rush off and develop our own metrics, that may be problematic. And what we're going to focus on is, is operational energy. 
Um, so this is particularly concerned with this performance gap. What we're going to look at is metrics that are based on actual energy usage in simple terms, if you like, at the meter. Um, and the big push that we will have in our um, policy campaign to government is to get the building regulations to shift to that kind of measure as well. So it's based on operational energy, not, not theoretical design models. A bit like we already test for air tightness in, in occupation. Embodied carbon, and we'll probably use the embodied carbon calculations that have been developed by the RICS because they're an accepted industry standard. Water consumption. And then what I've called a whole series of metrics that are not fully developed that yet around health and well-being. So I suppose in my simple terms, I think of it as a bit like avoiding the diesel problem, if you like. You know, for a number of years, everybody was told that diesel was the solution to reducing um, carbon usage. But we've now found there were all sorts of unintended consequences for that in terms of particulates. And there are some similar areas I think we're going to have to be careful of as we move to much more airtight buildings, etc. You know, we already know that in the UK we've got quite a big summer overheating problem in a lot of buildings we've built in the last 20 years. Um, we've probably got some problems with toxins in the environment where we've not got sufficient ventilation, etc. So there are these unintended consequences that we have to look out for. So this is the bit that is a bit techie, but it's just simply to say that the whole point of this exercise is to actually nail it down to particular metrics and these are the ones that have been proposed in terms of kilowatt hours per meter squared these are for the non-domestic buildings um, and these are how they correspond actually to the to the current deck ratings but of course we're talking about actually how do these buildings perform in use not not how they're designed um, these are the embodied carbon standards and these are the water consumption standards and these have been developed in collaboration with the uk climate change committee it's the water consumption ones that they're a little bit concerned about at the moment. They think they're quite ambitious, the, the water consumption ones, so there may be a little bit of, of change in relation to that. Um, and you can see at the bottom the beginnings of some of the kind of metrics that might come in around what I've called the kind of um, unintended consequences, the health and well-being aspects, in terms of what might be the, the maximum temperature. And you're probably aware, even under health and safety at work legislation in the UK at the moment, although there's a minimum, a minimum working temperature, there's no maximum working temperature. Uh, yeah. Um, this diagram is simply slightly crudely saying if you look at these deck A, B, C ratings, what we're really saying is for commercial buildings, if you could get a commercial building today that is performing to deck A rating, we're saying essentially you got where we think we need to be by 2030. If you're going to get there by 2025, that seems to be good practice. If you're going to get there by 2030, that's minimum practice, and beyond that is unsustainable. And I think you'll see the same metrics used for things like the RIBA awards, RIBA competitions, because there's going to be huge hypocrisy if we're asking practices to try and voluntarily sign up to these, these standards, but not applying them in those kind of arenas. Um, again, I won't go through the detail, but the, you obviously have to have slightly different metrics when you're talking about domestic buildings. Um, so there will be a different set of metrics for, for domestic buildings. And there's still a debate going on as to how we would actually ask charter practices if they do sign up to the challenge to, to voluntarily record those, those pieces of information. Carbon Buzz could be a platform, but there, there may be others. Um, I think the most important thing is that they're fairly simple metrics and they should be transferable between different collation systems, if you like. And just to say that that work sits within a package of work that developed from what was the RIBA Ethics and Sustainable Development Commission. So it is an element, the RIBA 2030 campaign, within this biggish package of work. Um, and there are probably two areas that I think we're going to hear a lot about over the next couple of years, and I know that the, the ARB is also very interested in. One is this whole agenda around climate change and whether the education system and the requirements around competence are sufficiently rigorous, particularly around energy literacy and, and building performance. And the other is around health and life safety, because you'll, be, you'll appreciate with the Hackett Review having made its recommendations, uh, the recent report raising the bar, that's another area in this kind of ethical arena that's under a, a lot of scrutiny at the moment. So I've, I've rattled through a little bit because I'm conscious that you've had a long day, but I hope that's given you a little bit of an oversight as to the work that's going on at the RIBA. I hope you'll hear more about the 2030 Climate Challenge fairly soon, end of September, early 
October at the latest. I thought I'd leave you with something slight. I think I think this is uplifting. I'm not sure. That I, 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 I thought I'd show you a slide of my favourite from a, 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 an image from my favourite artist, David Shrigley. Who I thought this one summed up a little bit of the challenge and the kind of yes, we can do it sort of mentality we need. This is um, this is the planet struggling on the tightrope, hanging above the abyss, abyss, and it says. But it's un we must act, but it is unrealistic to expect us to do anything before next year at the earliest. I think we've got beyond that now. Um, so hopefully we're going to do something before, before next year. Th thanks for your time, folks, and, and I hope you enjoy the bar now. Thanks, Adrian.